Okay, wonderful. Well, hello, everybody, officially. Um, do we have any public comment? I don't know if there's anyone from the public on. Do you want me to do introductions first? Yeah, maybe we should. Okay. All right. Ada Anderson? Here. Andrea Suhaka? Here. Barbara Boyer? Here. Bob Brocker? No Bob. Carrie Johnson? Hmm. Kathy Noon? They were in that other meeting, so they might be running late. Yeah. She'll be here. No, she's coming. Chris Lynn, Connie Ward. Good morning. Hi, Connie. Okay. Um, Don Perez. I'm here. Donna Mullins. Here. Gretchen Lopez. Hello. Jim Dale. Carrie, you're here. Perla Geller. Phil Cernanic. Present. Sean Wood. Steve Conklin. Here. Uh, Tex Elam. He said he might not be able to join right away. Tom Mahowald. <laughs> I hope I said that right. And Winshaw here. Okay. Do we have any guests visiting us today? Valerie Robson, Douglas or Jefferson County. <laughs> it looks like we've got uh, Lily. You are muted. Oh, hello. Good morning. I am just a public commenting. Wonderful. Welcome. And Mindy, I snuck on. Okay, Carrie, thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, anyone else pop on that did not? Perla's on. Name? Perla's on, okay. Um, Ivan. Okay. Okay. All right, well, Yes, let's open to public comment. Lily, you're muted. I'm so sorry. Good That's morning, okay. everyone. I don't know what this is all about, but I just keep, am here to comment. Am I supposed to go first or should you guys not go first? No, you, it's open to public comment, correct? Are you? Right. Yeah. Yes, I'm here to inquire about the fact that we in Denver no longer have an arthritis foundation. When I go onto the website of arthritis foundation, um, it actually links to the Atlanta branch and obviously we're in Denver. So that's why I'm here to talk about the fact that we definitely do need a representation of an arthritis research foundation of some sort. And as a licensed acupuncturist, DORA, uh, Department of Regulation Agency, DORA regulate, regulated licensed acupuncturist, I would love to do an acupuncture research using um, various protocols for arthritis, including RA as well as OA. And I think I might have OA, if you guys can tell from my finger, it's a little bit, uh, you know, showing up on the OA side. And I would love um, the DRCOG or the AAA to be able to handle or sponsor an acupuncture research for arthritis here in Denver. That way we can have that in the website when we go into drcog.org. We can look up arthritis foundation or arthritis research and at least something would pop up rather than an Atlanta branch. Um, I know my three minute is about to be up. Uh, some acronyms, 
acronyms I would love would be an an R A research or R A R. Rah! Uh, the other one would be O A R. OA, obviously, and research, or, um, and then um, the acupuncture acronym could be CARE, C-A-R-E, Center for Acupuncture Research and Evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. We will look into what is on Network of Care right now, but thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, Mindy, maybe we can make a note to look at that. Um, Erica, you're on the line. Do you want to make note of that to um, see what you can do? Lily, yeah. if you put your um, email address in the chat, um, Erica can get back to you. Perfect. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to report of the chair in which there is none today, except that it's very cold. <laughs> and and also that our our director Jayla is out ill, so we're sending her good wishes and speedy recovery. Okay, so we'll go ahead and and just skip over her report, and she'll catch us up next time. And let's move to approve um, the consent agenda and the minutes. Were there any comments or questions on on the minutes last time? Gary, hearing no questions, I'll motion for approval of the consent agenda. I'll second. Wonderful. Who any was the second? Uh, Andrea. 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 Andrea was okay. the second. Okay. Anyone opposed? Wonderful. And we will move to approve the meeting or the minutes from last time. Again, we're going to skip over Jayla. This is going to end up being a short meeting, you guys, um, because we were going to talk about the four-year plan. And what we'll do is just put it on next month's agenda, because I do think that's important that, that we hear that report. Um, Mary, can we ask... Uh, possibly if Mindy has the, the written report, maybe to put that out so that we're better prepared to actually have an expedited discussion next month. The, we, we don't have the written report yet, um, Phil. What we have is what we, we um, are sending to the state, which will not be the same as the consumer portion of that report. So what we have to do is it's not really that readable it's it's more of answering questions for the state and so we'll submit that at the end of march but between march and june we're going to work on what we call the consumer friendly report and that will be one that that will be more understandable to you um as the aca team and the public Thank you, Mindy. Yeah, Phil, Jayla was just going to give an oral presentation and then answer questions, and, and maybe we'll get to do that next month as well. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Um, we are going to skip ahead, and has AJ joined us? I see that he is on. Good morning. Hi, AJ. How are you all today? Good. And AJ is going to be presenting um, to us this morning on hospital transformation program. Mm -hmm. And uh, I apologize. I don't have a, a visual for you. I was uh, a little under the weather, so I wasn't able to, to make the deadline with it. But um, uh, I'll do my best to uh, uh, do a thousand words for every slide I had planned uh, to put together for the HTP. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'll just uh, jump right into it. Feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions, um, and uh, I'll also take some questions at the end. But um, so the HTP is the Hospital Transformation Program. It comes from uh, the state Medicaid office, uh, and it is a, a five-year project uh, that is designed to um, help hospitals 
not health systems, but hospitals themselves transition from a fee for service business model to um, a, a pay for performance business model, meaning instead of just getting reimbursed for the um, activities they uh, do uh, with a patient, they would be uh, paid for um, improving or maintaining a patient's health. Uh, so it's a fundamental sea change from how things are done now. And it's it's thought of as a, as a cost control measure. Um, so the HTP uh, uh, has a steps a, a, over five years. Um, and some of them uh, really do impact uh, community-based organizations like ours. Um, uh, to start, it's uh, it's a bit nuanced, but um, to start, uh, they are, are required to engage, the hospitals are required to engage in meaningful community engagement, meaning they have to go out into their community, talk to the, the people and the organizations and the stakeholders, figure out what is going on from a healthcare perspective and adjust their service offerings and how they deliver care to meet the needs of their community. Um, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a five-year uh, program. So we are in year uh, two. It, the timeline is a bit fuzzy because everything got delayed from COVID. And I, uh, so they are, the hospitals um, in January, uh, just last month, submitted their first baseline data on all the measures uh, they've been tracking for the past year. And I'll get to that in just a minute. But the, the program really hasn't ramped up yet. They're just now getting their um, uh, operationalizing their plans for all the activities they have to engage in. Um, and so we'll be seeing a lot more activity from each hospital and, and some of the other um, stakeholders uh, in the coming months. So as I mentioned, uh, they have engagement requirements. And so it's, it's kind of a, uh, an odd, uh, uh, it's not odd, it's, it's new for anybody who's not used to a clinical environment, but um, each hospital had to select quality measures that they would be measured on uh, to uh, actually say, okay, you are improving or maintaining the health of your patients. So things like reducing uh, unnecessary emergency department use and uh, decreasing uh, hospital readmissions. Um, so the hospitals were asked to uh, go into their communities and talk to people. What is causing readmissions? What is going on? Why are these things occurring? And then they would go back to their hospital and design uh, projects to address those needs to lower the uh, readmission uh, rates of Medicaid members in Colorado. Um, and so uh, they were supposed to have done that um, over the past couple of years. Um, there's a bit of question if, if they did a good job or not, um, but uh, uh, they're, they're about to operationalize those, those measures. And one of them, uh, other than readmissions, is engaging with um, their patients when they're admitted to the hospital uh, and screening them for five health-related social needs. And you guys, many of you have heard me talk about this quite a bit. Um, housing, housing needs, uh, transportation needs, uh, food needs, um, safety concerns, and utilities. So are you having trouble paying your utility bill? Do you feel unsafe in your home? Um, are you not able to uh, buy enough food um, uh, to last you the entire month? Um, do you have trouble getting to your medical appointments uh, because of transportation? And as they uh, uh, adopt, all hospitals were required to adopt that measure. Um, they were supposed to, and many of them did, uh, engage in that process to uh, interact with their communities and figure out what's going on. Um, and they, they tried their best, um, and some of them did a, a good job and some of them did not. Uh, but it's an ongoing process, so it'll last uh, over the next um, three years. Uh, to give you an example of why I'm a little critical, um, to discuss transportation uh, and the needs of people uh, in, in this community, um, one of the people they reached out to was uh, Ron Papsdorf, um, uh, the director of transportation at Dr. Cog, um, which is not um, a bad thing. He's a very knowledgeable individual. He's uh, quite the expert. But he's not 
as knowledgeable in the human service side of transportation as some other people in the community. So they found that Ron Papsdorf was an expert in transportation um, and, and spoke to him. Uh, and he also, uh, I love teasing him about this. This is my second time, even though he's not here. Uh, he doesn't remember it. Uh, not that he should. Uh, it happened a couple of years ago and he wasn't quite sure what was going on. But um, I think I saw someone raise a hand. Is that correct? It's Bill. Me. It's uh, Bill. Yes. Uh, AJ, uh, maybe in, if you're going to get to this, this will be fine. Uh, can you put some of this in the context of what are the discussions that uh, maybe we've had in the past or you've mentioned uh, elements in the past, but also things the legislature is uh, highlighting, uh, for example, like uh, prohibiting the facilities fees on a hospital bill, or uh, what's the level of Medicare, Medicaid reimbursements, or referrals that come out from the hospital, for example, that go to Dr. Cog, uh, for which they get incentives for making the referrals, but Dr. Cog doesn't receive, uh, or the area agency on aging doesn't receive any additional revenue to be able to handle that. Um, sure. And we get to those, that'll be great. But as you're talking about this hospital transfer transformation, uh, is it going to make some of these issues go away? Is it going to help us um, be in a better position to provide for older Coloradans? Help us. Sure. Um... So uh, for sections of that, you were looking over my shoulder at, uh, at my notes. So uh, thank you for that. But um, yes, uh, many of you have heard me and Jayla um, discuss how, uh, how much of a disconnect there is between um, what the, the state Medicaid agency wants to uh, happen versus what is actually going to happen in this area because um, the hospitals are paid to screen their inpatients and send referrals to community-based organizations to address those five needs or more if they're screening for more. Um, and then they have to submit a report uh, to, the, uh, to the regional accountable entity, the RAE, um, and then they're, they're, uh, uh, that meets the quality metric that they're held to. So just reporting the number of people uh, as a ratio, the percentage, they had 100 uh, inpatients, uh, they screened 95 of them, they have a 95% um, uh, screening rate done. If they had a 5% screening rate, that would still be okay. They just have to report the ratio of screened to inpatients. Um, and over time, that's going to transition. But for now, they're just doing it. However, I know that uh, Denver Health, uh, which has, I think, more than 450 beds, and they're the safety net provider for the, the state of Colorado and, the, and mostly the region. Um, in uh, January or December of last year, they screened 58% of their inpatients for these five needs, um, which is not an insubstantial amount. And that was, the, that was them um, implementing for the first time. That was one of their first months doing it. So they're starting out um, pretty well, and they're only going to improve from there. Now it's a Medicaid population, so not every person screened um, are older adults, but older adults make up a disproportionate share of, of hospital patients uh, on Medicaid, especially those 60 and over and, and duals. So we're uh, expecting and, and kind of seeing a little bit of data to show a, a tick up in uh, referrals from healthcare organizations. Uh, I tried to get um, uh, as much data from our contractors as possible, but um, uh, there wasn't uh, a standardized um, method of collecting it, so it was hard to to see any um, signal from the noise uh, of all the data. Um, so yes, Phil, to uh, again to maybe give two thousand words for your one uh, one picture question, um, the hospitals are being uh, incentivized, paid uh, with dollars. Um, to do this activity and the community-based organizations who are receiving these uh, referrals are left out in the cold um, for now. And we're, uh, I'm working very hard to uh, uh, um, address that, but it's, it's um, a slow process. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, Doug. 
AJ, if I may, I just wanted to add on to that um, a little bit. Listen, I, I mean, I've said this before. I think we, you know, us at the as Dr. Cog and the AAA, we're so appreciative that for um, really the first time, there's an acknowledgement as to the importance of the community-based services that are provided through our contractors and and the work that you all are doing. Right? Um, this this that 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 is that is worth noting for sure. Um, but I think the problem that we're having is what AJ ex expressed, right? It's like, you know, now that they recognize the importance of community-based organizations, we want a model that's actually going to work and not fail. And the model that they have in place right now is going to fail um, because, you know, you can't have, you know, incentivize referrals for, through the healthcare, uh, uh, healthcare industry. And then those referrals go to the, the community-based organizations that, that will do this work and not provide any funding. I mean, we already have waiting lists for the services that we're providing. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And I think everybody we talk to, they go, oh yeah, that makes sense. But I think it's been really hard to try to connect the dots to uh, actually get funding associated with. And that's something that quite frankly, it's going to be a bit of a call to arms for for all of us, right? To, in you know, to, in aggregate, to to um, apply some, excuse me, apply some some uh, some pressure to try to get us over the hump on this. It's uh, it's um, it's a little frustrating at times, but you know, listen, we'll get through it. And and there are some levers to pull um, with the Medicaid agency to finance. Uh, at least a portion of the of the needs uh, about uh, faced and about to be faced by community-based organizations. Um, and I can go into those. So thank you, Doug. Uh, but I also want to bring up a couple other things that are going on. Um, so what I just described in the hospital transformation uh, program, uh, the screening and referral process is for the Medicaid population. Now, in general, hospitals don't implement a workflow for one insurance type. They do it across the board and and sort the data out later. However, um, this isn't the only requirement they're facing. Starting in 2024, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are requiring all hospitals um, to uh, screen every uh, admitted patient 18 years of age and older uh, for these needs uh, and send referrals to community-based organizations. And that's part of their uh, quality reporting program. Um, everything's a program. Uh, and that, that is tied to payment as well. And on top of that, or in addition to that, um, the uh, private Medicare um, insurance plans, uh, Medicare Advantage, are also measured by a, a, a data set called HEDIS, um, which please don't ask me to explain what HEDIS <laughs> stands for, but um, it's a set of, of quality measures um, that uh, uh, are linked to the Medicare Advantage plan's reimbursement and ability to enroll members as insured uh, people so they can get paid to provide Medicare to them. That was a horrible description of how Medicare Advantage works. I do apologize. <laughs> so every uh, person uh, on a Medicare Advantage plan, that plan is reimbursed on a monthly basis by the federal government to manage their uh, health uh, through their healthcare providers. Um, and that payment is um, uh, affected by these measures. And this measure from HEDIS requires not only the screening, but they have to report what happened with the needs identified for each um, patient. So they have to not only say that, yes, this person has a need and 55% of our members have needs, they have to say, this is what we did to address the need. So that's going to even further um, fuel the fire. So you add all of this activity together. And as Doug said, it's, it's amazing. To, it's an amazing compliment. Um, but now uh, we have to actually um, design or redesign things so they work so that people can get the services they need to lower their readmission rates to manage hey. the one c Yeah. AJ, um, sorry, my camera's not working. It's Carrie. Okay. But how do you get ahead of this. I mean, working, trying to get something changed at the federal level and with Medicaid, and, and now we see it's already happening. The referrals are being made. Um, the providers are already being taxed with this. What is the plan of action? And is there anything this group can do to help with that? And I know it'll take quite a while, but what what is the plan? 
Um, so I've, uh, uh, I'm working on a couple of things, uh, uh, a few things, one uh, on the operational side, uh, and two others on the, um, um, working with the state agency. So I've, I've managed to, um, uh, join the, um, community advisory council, uh, to the HTP and the chase board, and I'll be pushing, uh, this issue. And there are mechanisms that the state can use um, to actually fund community-based services. Uh, and it's just a matter of getting them uh, to engage in those activities. Mm -hmm. um, there are models uh, from across the country. Um, I don't want to get too into the weeds with Medicaid policy, but there are funding mechanisms that the state could tap into uh, from the federal government that could then, uh, they could fund uh, community organizations um, to a certain extent, uh, to provide these services to Medicaid members, which would be in their long-term interest. So uh, I'm uh, pushing for that um, uh, with the state aid, with the state Medicaid agency, uh, and I hope to have um, some news for you by the by the summer. Uh, hopefully, good, but um, I'm not sure quite yet. Okay, uh, hey, uh, Lily yes. has her hand up. Oh, sorry, Lily. Hi, AJ. Thank you very much for your program, which. I, as a public member, have been a recipient of, and I have seen this when I went to Well Power for a, a psychological mental situation, and they did ask questions on housing, transportation, food, safety, as well as utility. I have seen them give out a um, cup of noodles to people who are asking, and as well as clothing provided for them. I've seen them call transportation, like a taxi, to bring them to wherever they need to go back to, I guess. Um, but I, I really like the fact that you guys have initiated this and this is coming down into the public already. Um, mm -hmm. Even though I'm not of the aging population, but I do see that it is already starting to help people, even just mentally hearing that there are these available options for us um, that I did not take advantage of, but that it just makes you feel as a public feel better that the government is actually taking care of the people. So congratulations on that. As to Doug Rex's, Rex's um, comment, as well as um, um, your DRCOG comment regarding budgeting and, and getting grants and stuff like that, if you could work on that, that would, if you guys could work on that, that would be great. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for that. Um, and And, just to clarify, uh, Dr. Cog isn't implementing the the HTP. If I, um, uh, the state Medicaid agency is, but we're uh, hoping to to help them with it. Um, but and AJ, hey, sorry, yes. we've got no, Phil go and then Connie. Phil, I know you can't probably see him. Um, <clears throat> AJ uh, and Rex or uh, Doug. Um, is part of the issue is that the hospital transformation program is focusing on healthcare costs and the costs associated with providing community-based services uh, doesn't get looked at on the same table, even though it impacts the healthcare costs. And um, I think it might be a good place to start to take some of the arguments uh, that the reason why they're looking at uh, the referrals is because the referrals do work to reduce long-term healthcare costs, but they need to realize that there is a cost to the community-based services. And if they aren't looking at that, or they're casting a blind eye to that, who do we tell? How do we mobilize? Uh, to bring some of that to the fore. Um, Doug, I, you're the boss, so you want to go first? You want me to <laughs> answer? No, go ahead, AJ. All right. So yeah, and you know, I, I, um, I'll, I'll start uh, a little bit earlier in the timeline. From like 2010 to 2016, everybody thought. Oh, I bet you addressing someone's food needs or transportation needs would lower the cost of healthcare. Um, and so they started working on that and they did a lot of studies. They created a body of knowledge. And now they found that, yes, in fact, that is true. Um, if you address social needs, you decrease the need for expensive healthcare. Um, and now 
they're uh, taking the approach that, okay, let's identify the, our patients with these needs and send them to the organizations that address those needs, which is the uh, common sense, rational thing to do. However, I, I think of it in, in after my um, indignation uh, evaporated a few years ago, um, <laughs> I, I thought about it, you know, kind of from their perspective. Uh, when you say, um, you know, they don't understand what it takes to provide someone a meal or provide someone transportation on a regular basis. Uh, and why should they? Um, they that's not their, uh, their area of expertise. But now that they know it impacts uh, everything that they're trying to work on, cost, quality, um, um, patient satisfaction, and just the, the, the lives of people in our community, uh, they're doing what they think is best. And that's just, they're just like 50% shy of an A. They're doing the, the first part right, uh, and they're getting good at it. Uh, but now it comes down to letting, enabling the professionals like us uh, to um, uh, address these needs. Um, and so, uh, Phil, to answer the, the second part of your question, um, uh, there, there is uh, an effort uh, that we're working on to, to mobilize all the community-based organizations. Uh, we've recruited new members to the Community Advisory Council um, uh, to the HTP, a, a couple of um, AAA directors. Um, if any of you would like to join this advisory board or council as well, um, please let me know. I can put you in touch with them. Um, and we're really starting to um, agitate for attention. And, and the, the good thing is, is that uh, the healthcare providers, the state um, agency, Medicaid agency, they know that the community organizations need more funding. Um, they just need to be pushed to make it a priority. And I think once we we push them a little bit, um, there there are a few activities that they could engage in uh, to open up some funds, at least for the Medicaid population, that would really help. Um, and there's a lot of other stuff going on, including how the referrals are actually being sent, uh, and the the governor's office is working on an initiative to do that. And so, what we are doing is uh, developing a a network of um, uh, AAA uh, contractors to um, work with healthcare to help them uh, get their patients' needs met, um, but we're also asking them to um, to pay for those services. So we have a few uh, initiatives that we're working on as that's part of the other part of my day job, um, and we're we're building out our um, data system to be able to send inf client information to our contractors. So they don't have to wait for a, a, a client to reach out to them. They can do active enrollment. Um, and we're working with, um, uh, we hope to work with the recipient of the state's funding um, on this referral system uh, to really build up the infrastructure of the community-based organizations. But that's a, a bit more, um, uh, the, the contract hasn't been awarded yet. So I don't wanna tell you this is happening. Um, it's, a, it's a potential. Um, and then of okay. course, oh yes. Um, you forgot Connie. She has her oh. hand. <laughs> I would never forget Connie. I just didn't know her hand was up. Sorry, Connie. <laughs> no worries. Good to see you, AJ. So I have a couple of, it's kind of a two-part question. Um, you probably know that Medicare Advantage applications have these social system or um, surveys embedded in them. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, the results of those surveys from these carriers, are they 100% referred to community programs? And if they are, or to whatever degree they are, are they funded at all by the insurance carriers who refer them? So I got a three-part answer for you. Um, so uh, to my knowledge, and it's not, um, uh, I'm not an expert in this area, uh, those um, uh, indicators of need on the application, um, I'm not sure what is done with them. I know, we get a limited uh, number of referrals um, from one uh, Medicare Advantage or one insurance uh, carrier in the region. Um, but that gets to the quality of the referrals, um, which is uh, a very important piece. Uh, if you think it, think about it, you might, I'm not sure if someone from the SHIP program could correct me if I'm wrong here. You enroll in Medicare Advantage in November and your coverage may not start until January. So the, the Advantage plan isn't, um, doesn't feel responsible for your health until then. And by then the indicator of need is, is two months old. 
Um, so is it still a need of yours? Are you still, do you remember making that report? Um, is addressing that need still a priority for you? And so when the community organization, if they've gotten the referral, when they reach out, they're, they don't know who you are and why you're calling them. Um, and so they, uh, they don't necessarily engage unless um, they still have the need. Uh, and so it's, it's about um, what we call the warm handoff between the healthcare entity or insurance provider and the community-based organization and facilitating that so um, it's, it's a, a positive experience for the client or potential client to become a client and receive services. And the second part of your question, Connie, is there funding for that? Right now, Medicare Advantage um, provides uh, funding to the plan uh, for limited food uh, services and limited transportation services, but that has not um, trickled down to the community-based organizations in any organized way, but that is one area we're, we're targeting in our efforts. At least to Dr. Cog. I can't Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions? So you all understand the HTP and the other uh, uh, <laughs> initiatives thoroughly. I'm glad. Um, um, well then, uh, if there's no other questions, um, I'll I'll just let you know that um, hopefully in the summer I'll have a, a follow up report to the ACA to talk about um, what we're doing at Dr. Cog um, to to work with healthcare um, and uh, these other initiatives to. Um, uh, start to address this need, but it's going to be an ongoing process um, and conversation that we're going to have with with many um, types of organizations in healthcare. Thank and you, HA. So, thank you. That's a big task, and uh, I'm glad you're on it. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm not going to let Doug off the hook, though. Um, the The question was uh, how how do we mobilize? And knowing that we're only the advisory committee on aging and there's the Dr. Cog board, uh, which is a broad representation of elected officials from around the region. Um, what, what's happening with the mobilization, Doug? Thank you, Phil. I left the room for a little bit. I thought I stalled long enough, but I guess I came back too soon. <laughs> no, I... It's a great question, and quite frankly, as far as mobilization, listen, we're we're looking to mobilize anyone and everyone, right? Um, but I will tell you that I do believe we need to be a little more overt with our messaging. Um, and I, I, um, so the agenda is not finished yet, but part of our so we have our annual board retreat coming up in April, and this I would suggest will be a topic for conversation and begin that messaging with our board and, and um, applying pressures wherever we can through those elected officials to be able to, um, you know, to show people the light, right? I mean, we, and we're coming at this from an angle that we want this to be successful. Um, it's not that we just want money. We want this to be successful. And in order for that to happen, there have to be resources that the folks that are actually doing the work be able to to be able to accomplish this. So, so Phil, to answer your question, um, this will be taken up with the board at our April April annual board retreat. Thank you, sir, for the question. Uh, uh, of course, Doug. You know you can count on me. I know. <laughs> I miss you, Mayor. <laughs> and just to clarify, I I heard that we are going to have more. Um, information comes summertime with maybe more of an action plan that this committee and others could join in. Is that correct? Um, I was uh, uh, offering to report on on kind of the initiatives I'm working on and and what uh, might be done. Okay. Um, but i'm I'm open to um, suggestions on what that might entail as well. Well, I think you did say, AJ, too, that that anybody who was interested in in joining a, a task force or or helping yeah. with that to let you know. Is that correct? Absolutely. That's the Community Advisory Council, uh, that, to the okay. HTP and the Chase Board. Um, and if you are interested in joining that, and that's, um, we meet, uh, uh, currently it's once a month, but it's about to move to quarterly. 
Um, and we talk directly to the staff at, at the state Medicaid agency that is working on this um, about what the community is seeing and how we can be of assistance to the hospitals. Right. Okay. Phil, there's your challenge. There you go. Uh, AJ, you know how to contact me. Let me know. I'm sorry. My email is not working. <laughs> if, uh, <laughs> no, I'll, I'll uh, send you an email here shortly, Phil. Thanks. Wonderful. Okay, any other questions uh, for AJ? No, thank you again, AJ. Good information. Thank you, have a good Friday. Okay, we've got Erica joining us with a transportation update. Hello, Erica. Hello, everyone. I also have my program manager, Mallory Miller, who's gonna help me do this presentation as well. I know we just chatted with you all in October, gave you a really big update on what's going on with our transportation services. So I don't have too, too much to share that's in addition to what we kind of went over in October, but we do want to update you on some things. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All righty. Perfect. Okay. So some updates on what's been happening. So we kind of do it a year in review, not the fiscal year, the actual calendar year for you all. So in 2022, as you all know, we made a lot of large changes to the AAA transportation model. We went over that um, in October, but so far things have been going pretty well. The program has been sustainable. We're right now we're at 570 unique uh, riders that are utilizing our transportation program currently. And then in 2022, we did a total of 26, almost 27,000 one-way trips between all of our programs, which would be Hop, Skip, Drive, Uber. And then in the fall, we started with Carepool, which I'll talk a little bit about. So uh, we also gave out lots of bus tickets. We gave out almost 33,000 bus tickets in 2022. And then we spent in the year 2022, which is not to be confused with the fiscal year, because I'm not talking about fiscal year, I'm talking about the calendar year. We spend over $800,000 on our transportation services. Um, in January alone uh, this year, we spent over $66,000 in transportation services, which was an increase. Um, this was the first time we spent that much since October. Uh, in November and December, we did not spend that much. So this was the first time we've seen that high of a monthly spending uh, since back in October of last year. So Hop, Skip, Drive is the one service that we've been providing the longest outside of our bus tickets. Uh, we talked about why back in October, we've seen a decrease in the number of rides that we're providing Hop, Skip, Drive with Hop, Skip, Drive because a lot of people switched to Uber. And in January, we provided a lot of trips um, with Uber, but I'll talk about that in a second. If for for this are how many one-way trips we have been providing folks with Hopscope Drive. As you can see, there's been quite a steady decline since we implemented those larger service changes with this model, uh, mostly because the average cost per one-way trip is about $36 with Hopscope Drive. In January, we did 605 one-way trips as well. So we averaged about 1,300 trips per month with Hopsco Drive, doing, doing nearly 16,000 for the year 2022. Uber trips, as we talked about, have just gone up and up and up, but that's because people can get a lot more trips for the same monthly budget that they're getting outside of instead of hop, skip, drive. So the average cost in, in 2022 was about $17 per one-way trip. So that's half the cost of hop, skip, drive. We had 155 active riders with Uber, and then we did almost 11,000 trips in 2022. As you can see, the rides have been going steadily upwards. We had a little dip in November. And then let's see what, this is just over, oh no, go back, uh, 1,800 trips in January. We did about a little bit more than December. We did 1,868 rides with Uber, 
Um, so it is continuing to go up because folks love the freedom and the ability to get rides on demand. Um, and so our ridership has more than doubled in three months because of all those changes that we had made. So folks are actually getting more rides with Uber than they were previously with Hop, Skip, Drive. And then here's a quick little update on our bus tickets. Just of note, this slide in your ACA packet had an incorrect number on it. We had on it that we had 155 unique riders for RTD, that was incorrect, apologies for that. It is actually 271 unique riders for bus tickets. Uh, in 2022, we did nearly 33,000 tickets. Um, as you can see, the discount tickets are the winners for who for what we give out for our transportation services. Um, Accessory comes in second. And so CarePool, we brought on CarePool in the fall of last year. Um, as you can see, it's been a slow growth for CarePool with us. Um, it, we felt bad because we signed on, they, they started providing our services, and then we went on a wait list for our transportation services. So we've been slowly trying to entice people to switch over who um, might be more suited for CarePool because CarePool can provide a little bit extra help. Our one rider who has pretty much done the vast majority of these trips uh, with CarePool absolutely loves their service. So we've been trying to reach out to riders who have historically used Hop, Skip, Drive to see if they'd be interested in trying CarePool just because they provide a little bit more hands-on assist if you need help getting in and out of the car. And also they have promised us a wheelchair accessible van um, we have not actually been able to utilize that. It has been at a commission, but Mallory, it's in March, right? That they promised they're gonna have it available to us. Um, we actually had our first person take oh. that trip this week. So um, the wheelchair van got fixed and it is um, back in use. So we're super excited about that. Um, we have some folks who would definitely benefit from that and this provider specifically. So we're really excited. Um, we had in January 16 one-way rides, so we are growing every month. <laughs> With CarePool, we definitely want to keep them as one of our providers, so we're, we're working hard to get more riders over to them. Real quick on the number of calls we've had between INA and ride calls. Um, I know when I had touched based in October, uh, our ride calls historically for a couple of years had always outpaced our INA calls. We saw quite a dip in our ride calls after we made those programmatic changes in July, but they're picking back up again. So in December, you can see our INA went down and our riders ride calls went back up and that trend continued in January with 579 calls for INA and only and um, 745 for our ride calls. So we definitely are seeing an uptick again in people calling about ride scheduling. And may I ask a question? Oh, yeah, sorry, I can't, I'm not looking at everyone. So hop in, um, feel free to. Is the INA just a referral or do they schedule the ride? Nope, those are two different. So okay. with, yeah, so with this slide, so ride calls are about ride scheduling specifically. INA calls are pure information and assistance calls. Okay. Um, yep. So Erica, I, yep. I had a question here. This is Bob Brocker. So uh, a couple of questions. So with Hopskiff Drive costing double what Uber costs, um, are you phasing it out or what, why does it sit still on the program? That's one question. And the other one is, is Carepool the only one who's doing door-to-door -door service? Nope, all, all of them are, um, Hopskiff Drive is door-to-door -door as well. Um, we just find that the overall, Mall Mallory, you've worked more with Carepool. Take, you can, I'll answer the first part. No, we are definitely not phasing out Hop Skip Drive at all. Our riders who ride Hop Skip Drive, they do very much enjoy that service. And when there's a lot of folks who cannot switch over to Uber because of the smartphone requirement, Mallory, you want to take on the second question? Yes. Yeah, so um, we wouldn't phase out Hop Skip Drive or Careful. Our program requires folks to have choice, and so. 
this allows them to have choice. Um, so it's up to them how they utilize their funding every month. And if they want to stick with hop, skip, drive, um, because it does provide that um, their drivers go through more additional background screenings than with Uber. So um, it, they, it tends to be viewed as a safer service um, comparatively. Did I answer that question or miss the other part? The door to door, the door to door. Oh question. yes. So hop, skip, drive, Uber, and Careful are all door to door. They'll come directly to you know your front door and then bring you directly to the main entrance of your destination. Um, they're not door through door. They won't go into the house and help someone out, but um, they will make sure they get from point A to point B. Mallory, is there anyone who is door through door right now in this pool that you use? Not at this time. It's definitely something we would like to um, find a provider to take that on. Um, but currently we brought on Carepool, which is our most recent expansion to be able to provide services to those with a wheelchair. Because um, previously we just were able to provide the accessoride tickets. Okay. So we're always working to increase options. Just on a side note, I had talked with um, a gentleman living in um, Highlands Ranch who was absolutely thrilled about the um, Uber partnership with Accessoride, just giving him so much more freedom, flexibility. Uh, it, he just really enjoyed that. That is really awesome that they're doing that. We've actually um, confirmed that we can work together so that mm -hmm. folks can use the Accessoride um, Uber feature, but pay for it partially with our Uber funds. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's that's nice. And it would be nice to get some more wheelchair um, options out there, but it sounds like you're you're working on that. Yeah. We're, we're, we've, we're just, we were just talking to Travis this week about how we can get more <laughs> providers that are uh, wheelchair accessible. So we're, we're looking into those options. Mallory is going to be doing some research on the contractors that uh, partner with Intelleride. Um, and though we're going to highly vet those partners as Intelleride doesn't typically get a good reputation, but we're going to look into this because a lot of those tend to be more wheelchair accessible. Um, type agencies. Our are you finding, with, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Erica. I just mm -hmm. am curious. Are you finding that it's still difficult to find um, providers? I mean, we, we heard about all the staff shortages and the expenses, and it just seems like transportation is really very difficult right now and has been for the last two years. Yeah, I mean, that's part of the struggle with Carepool is they were really ra ramping up to provide our services. And then it, it was challenging because we didn't take on new people right when we were able to start utilizing them. And then it flip flopped where they didn't have enough drivers for us. <laughs> um, so then we're like, oh, we got we got riders, we got people. And then they're like, oh, I actually can't staff that ride. And so we're, we've been in this this challenging situation with Carepool of do we, how many more people do we offer that program, you know, that specific provider to, can they staff all the rides we schedule with them? So we're in that really uh, ba hard balancing act with Carepool right now, but we tried to, we, Mallory had a manage a situation about with that last month, but the rider was really nice and understanding about it. He was just happy that he was no longer on the wait list and was just excited if he could actually get one ride a month at this point <laughs> compared to what he was having to do before. So it's a balancing act right now between that. So so Erica, one, one quick other question on the dollar part of this. So uh, it sounds like each rider basically has a, a budget, a monthly budget of, of how much they can spend. And so how much is that? There, right now it's at 400. Um, we're constantly reviewing whether that's the appropriate amount for folks. Um, Mallory's, we're looking, we're doing a lot of data analysis. It never stops with transportation. I think we analyze data almost every day with transportation. Um, and we're trying to decide what, if we need to change things for the next fiscal year, if we need to go into a tiered model, I know Carrie, you had brought that up back in October. Um, if we're going to just overall lower the total monthly spending, we're kind of all over the place and have not landed anywhere at all. So we're still figuring things out. 
So Eric, okay. I, can I put my two cents in? I hope you'll continue to consider a tiered, uh, you know, for the Eastern Plains and for the mountain communities. Yep. yep. Don't worry, Carrie. Me, I haven't forgotten about you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Erica. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, so enrollments over time, you know, you'll see that gap in September uh, when, when we didn't enroll anybody. You'll see those enrollments for October and November were 100% RTD because we got the go ahead to continue with RTD during that time when we started the wait list. But in December, we got the okay to start pulling people off of our wait list. So in December, we started to enroll people for all of our programs again. So we were able to get four people enrolled in December for our services. We enrolled 25 people in January. And then as of the 9th of February, we had enrolled 46 people off the wait list. But our wait list is at 346 people as of today, um, about an hour ago. So it is, we can take people off, but more people come right back on. We definitely saw a, a kind of a lull after we implemented the wait list because this program has been nothing but word of mouth over the years. And I think word of mouth had gotten out, we were on a wait list. But then word of mouth came out that we started to enroll people off the wait list. And we've seen quite the bump in requests for our transportation services since January as well. So overall program spending for 2022, you'll see Uber went up and and a hop, skip, drive went down. At the very bottom, it's a hard, the line is our care pool. And then our RTD is pretty level, little spikes, little dips, but overall, um, RTD is kind of a level playing field. So the future of this program, Mallory. Okay, so we have some exciting news. Um, so we secured funding um, about $900,000. It's not officially approved yet. It won't be officially approved until May, um, but that additional funding is going to allow us to grow our program. So we'll be able to take on two mobility coordinators. So we currently have um, one mobility coordinator who um, we had a staff member leave in December. So they'll be starting in March. And then we have a community resource specialist on the team currently. So we'll have a total of five, including myself, come July. Um, with this funding, we're also going to be able to about double the amount of clients we serve. We estimate we're going to be able to serve an additional 312 consumers. Um, that's you know a rough estimate because some folks might spend more than others. It depends what programs they use, but we are definitely going to greatly increase the number of folks we're serving and hopefully greatly reduce that wait list that we have. Um, additionally, we're going to um, I've signed up to become an official travel trainer certified through the Easter Seals. So they have an official travel training program um, that they encourage folks like myself to go through um, so that you can get best practices and how to develop a travel training program. So we'll be um, rolling out an official travel training program this next fiscal year. We provided some um, travel training this current fiscal year through at our Aurora Center for Active Adults um, to our refugee community. And that training has gone really well. Um, we'll be back there again in the spring to um, continue that. And so that's what inspired taking on a greater travel training program. So um, we'll be working on developing that over the next couple months and rolling that out um, in early fall this year. And then, um, we're still waiting to find out about the Ride Alliance grants, but we submitted a grant back in November. And I just checked today, and unfortunately, there's still no update there. So very eager to find out if we got the funding to really finally finish that project and get it launched, which would be a huge change, um, an improvement for more regional transportation coordination in the whole Denver metro area. So exciting stuff going on in transportation. Gary. So um, it's exciting they got two mobility coordinators coming on. Congratulations to you guys. Uh, having said that, you are going to double the amount of consumers in one year. That sounds like a huge task. 
I mean, we're going to pretty much wipe out our wait list is the goal. Yeah. <laughs> Which would, you know, at the, the minute we take somebody off, somebody calls and comes back on. So yeah, we're, yeah, we'll probably still have a wait list for a while, but with the additional two staff, with more folks going over to Uber, um, we're also exploring, forgot to mention this, um, expanding our RTD option. So we're looking at digital bus tickets right now too. Um, so I do feel good that we'll be able to increase the amount of clients served. Um, when did you have a question? I do. Um, I was wondering if it's possible to leverage someone like Dr. Mack for the travel training program. Um, I think they have one. They do. Ours is ours is going to be slightly different from them. Okay. And we're going to be working in with partnership with, with Dr. Mack. We haven't connected with them yet because they haven't received their formal funding um, yet as well. So we are going to be working in conjunction with them, but but it'll be different. Mallory's got some pretty awesome ideas floating around in, in her uh, idea pool, which she's got a lot of. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. We, we definitely won't be duplicating, so. Are there any other questions? No? Thank you both so much for the update. It sounds like lots of excitement and growth going on. And it's interesting, your comment on as soon as you open up the wait list, then it refills again. And boy, isn't that the case for everyone in transportation? Mm -hmm. so, but you're definitely making progress. Karen, you know, I, I think what's exciting is that, you know, we've talked about uh, places for priority and uh, certainly food is a, a huge one, but then right up there is transportation. Mm -hmm. And uh, to see some of these new goals and the expansion of the services uh, is really pretty exciting. Agreed. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? No, thank you so much. I It'll be really um, exciting to see and get an update once, once the funding is approved or you hear officially. Okay. Thank you. All right. How about Dr. Cogboard? Uh, reports. We have a new member, Tom. We didn't get to meet you officially. Is Tom still on? I think he came in a little late. I wonder he's if he's on. Is he still on? Yeah, looks like it. Well, I'll just jump in and welcome and thank Tom for volunteering. <laughs> and, uh, appreciate him joining Wynn and I. And Tom, feel free to jump in and, and do an introduction if, if you are so inclined. Tom is uh, on the board of trustees in Netherland and is their Dr. Cock rep. So we thank him for that. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that as of this week, Wynn Shaw is officially vice chair of Dr. Cog, having been elected to that position. So congratulations, Wynn. Yeah. Uh, and I guess that means I'm now chair. So when will uh, take over when I finish my service as chair? <laughs> Tom, I see you. Do you want to make any comments? One sec. There we go. Um, just uh, glad to be here. Uh, really enjoyed my uh, my first uh, AAA meeting, my first uh, sub-regional, um, and my first two board meetings is, uh, is a lot of fun. This is a great group. Um, and the transportation stuff uh, was especially interesting. And the hospital stuff is especially frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Uh, glad to have you here. A couple things from the Dr. Cog board. Uh, at our last meeting, we elected officers, as mentioned. Uh, also, we talked about federal performance measures that deal with safety, that deal with bridges and fatalities and accidents and all of those things and what those, those measurements are. Uh, received a very good presentation on that. Uh, we also... Uh, at the uh, Regional Transportation Committee meeting, Wynn and I heard uh, information about the coordination of traffic lights and, and just really the, the overall uh, interaction of municipalities and, and that in terms of trying to keep the traffic going. One of the goals being obviously keeping people from idling too long at stoplights. Uh, but I think it's every time I hear that, the next week I 
feel like I'm at stoplights more than I was before I heard the presentation, but I think that's just Murphy's Law. Uh, and then we also got a, a lengthy update and had a, a robust conversation on legislative matters that are coming up. This is going to be a very interesting session. Uh, lots of things related to housing uh, and uh, you know, creating more housing, possibly affordable housing. One of the things that we're monitoring is there's conversation about preemption of local rules in terms of zoning. Uh, and that has not been introduced yet, at least last I knew, but we'll be monitoring that to see where that goes. Uh, the thought being that, that by preempting municipalities from being able to have single family zoning, you know, some of the things that, that have, have traditionally been a part of, of local governance, uh, that that may increase uh, stock of housing and therefore that may bring down the price. One of the challenges, and I think this group probably knows very well, is in many cases when a, a property is changed into a new property, uh, in the case of around Sloan's Lake in Edgewater, where a, a property that was largely more affordable is rebuilt, oftentimes it's built to be very unaffordable. <laughs> and so you, you take something that may be $300,000 and it suddenly becomes two units worth almost a million dollars. So that's obviously one of the things that we're looking at as, as Dr. Cog continues to want to be a part of that housing conversation as it uh, you know, comes together with transportation and those other issues. Uh, we also talked about our retreat, which will be coming up. And uh, that probably is enough of a report. Doug, is there something I should have mentioned that I missed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. I, I just wanted to share with the group um, with regards to the bylaw recommendations, committee bylaw recommendations that you all made back some time ago now. I think it was early fall. Um, we are taking that, planning on taking that to the board in March, along with changes to the Regional Transportation Committee guidelines and the Transportation Advisory Committee guidelines. So you can blame the transportation folks for, for the delay in getting this to the board with an understanding that we there's, there's a good possibility, and I think you've had this conversation, that we will be amending the ACA bylaws again uh, to uh, comply with the guidance we received on the, on the Older Americans Act later on this fall. So we plan on opening up the bylaws again, as well as at the board level, we're going to uh, look at their two internal committees, the Performance and Engagement Committee and the Finance and Budget Committee, their bylaws, as well as the Articles of Association, because all three of those are tied. So I just wanted to share that with you, too. So you'll have more bylaw discussion later on this summer. So, Rick, uh, Doug, is, does yes, this sir. mean uh, all of our uh, ACA members will have to reapply for appointment? No, Phil, I don't believe so. Hey, Steve. Kyle, Tuck. But I know we're not supposed to ask, you know, uh, specific questions about our jurisdiction, but um, uh, for both of us and Jeffco, we're waiting for you to figure out the uh, Sixth Avenue Colfax intersection. Can you see <laughs> that go away or uh, do a flyover or something? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like no comment, Carrie. No comment to say. <laughs> When, when did you have anything to add? I I just wanted to give a quick uh, vote of thanks to Carrie Erickson, who uh, attended our Living and Aging Well in Lone Tree luncheon and shared some of what Douglas County is uh, doing and has available for our uh, our wonderful aging, aging population. So... Oh, thank you, Wynn. That was a fun group. We are fun. <laughs> You're fun. Gosh darn it. Yeah, that was really fun. Thank you so much. Um, I, have right. to add, I have to add something. Um, our LCC has been trying to create a strategic plan. We came up with a new term, age advantaged. Skip senior and all those other things and call Call us old folks age advantaged. I like it. I like it. I, I like an example yes. um, in, a, in a seminar I did the other day, experienced <clears throat> livers. <laughs> that was and then again, cool. I didn't hear what you said. Experienced livers. Ah, there you go. <laughs> 
livers, as in lives, not yeah, the yeah. organ. <laughs> hey, Jim. hey, Carrie, Jim. Yeah. Yes. Um, I just had a question for Doug since I've been off the board for a while. How much have construction costs gone up and how's that affecting our, uh, you know, contributions from, from locals and from counties that they have to do for a match? How, how's this all balancing? Yeah, um, Jim, thank you for the question, sir. And it's great seeing you. Uh, it, it's significant, right? It, it, we're, we're looking at, we're seeing cost increases over the last year from estimates that we received, you know, in our in the funding proposals, anywhere from really 12 to 18 percent over. Um, so, I mean, you know, when you're talking million dollar projects, I mean, that that starts to add up. Right. Um, so we you know, we are trying to mitigate that to the to the extent that we can. Um, we had some um, return funds that we made available for folks to kind of offset some of that, those costs. But it's it's, you know, some of the some some uh, infrastructure programs are just hemorrhaging right now. There's no no doubt about it. And quite frankly, it's hard to find contractors that actually take this work on because of, you know, some of the um, employment issues. Right. So. Thanks, Doug. Sure. And, thanks. And, and since I have the microphone, I want to wish my buddy, Steve Conklin and my other buddies, when uh, great luck as they continue to serve on the board. I just know how dedicated they are and how much work they do. And I, I kind of miss Dr. Cog uh, being this <laughs> retiree out here, but it's it's still important. Kerry, thanks for bringing up the topic in the first place. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And we miss having you on the board. But we still get you on ACA. That makes me smile. Good. Oh, thank you all. Good stuff. Um, what about county reports? And I can't believe it. We're going to end so early, but this is what happened when Jayla's not here. <laughs> yes. What? Any county reports? Well, our, next, um, our next JCCOA is maybe one of our most important meetings of the year because we'll be meeting with uh, the three county commissioners, just, uh, you know, verbalizing back and forth our concerns for older adults in Jeffco, what their needs are. Um, the county is just that are taken kind of a, I don't know all the details of it, but uh, a very extensive program is trying to provide uh, housing for a homeless and particularly older adults uh, who are homeless. So we have a lot of things to talk about with them. Looking forward to that meeting. Boy, that's going to be a good one, Carrie. Madam Chair, if I may, uh, this is this is Doug. Just to add on to that, Carrie, if if you need any support or anything from us prior to that meeting, sir, don't be shy. Reach out. Well, uh, thank you, Doug. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's a hard topic. I know in Douglas. They've got a new team called the Heart Team, which is, I won't get it right, when you might remember, but it's homeless, something. Engagement. Engagement. And navigation. Okay. And, I don't right. know what it stands for, for, but yeah, it's to help. Yeah. It's to help the homeless population with resources. So the R is resources. Resource mm -hmm. team. So team. what we're missing is the A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And okay, it's a clever acronym. I need my husband here, who's the communication <laughs> guy. He would just know right what it is. But yep. yeah, that's sure a boy, that's a hard one. Any other county reports? Maybe it's just the word and. Maybe, maybe that yeah. makes sense. engagement and resource team. Oh, look at that. We solved it. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Brilliant. Hey, Carrie, this is Kelly. I think Tex had his hand up there for a minute. Oh, Tex, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Uh, no, no sweat. Um, just a couple of um, transportation things because they're not conclusive, but they will be the gossip. And uh, it'd be useful for you to have some real information as opposed to the gossip, which is running pretty thoroughly at the moment. Um, I mentioned last time that this demand, uh, access on demand thing has gotten started. It, it has moved further. 
as it moves further, it runs into more, more problems. And uh, RTD is doing a substantial job in trying to deal with what has been a changing application form, which once they put it out, there was a need to change it, which is the worst thing you can do. And so they're trying to sort through duplicate applications and the like. But the program, as um, was mentioned last time, really is working. And for those of us who use it, it's really marvelous. It's the most creative thing that I know of for, for handicapped folks. The, the other uh, issue, and it, again, it is an RTD issue, the it happens that the contracts for the uh, accessorized services and such have been being postponed since last October when they were supposed to go into effect because of a of a suit that came about by a vendor that was not included the they decided instead of permitting the procedure to proceed to start it all over again, which of course extends the current contract, which has some deficit problems in the contract. And so last Friday, the contractor, you know, people like uh, even Dr. Cog don't do contracts themselves they have a person handling the contract for them that that represents them the contractor for rtd for the um, accessoride programs uh, made an announcement on friday that was contrary to the announcement that had been made five months before uh, before it was restarted and changed the elements of the contract. Uh, one of the examples is that VIA will no longer, under this pr process, if, if it happens, will no longer be operating Accessoride. All of Accessoride will be handled by one group out of what had been three groups before, a company that has not been um, noted for its uh, outstanding performance. I don't mean that that means that uh, VIA, as an example, doesn't get anything. As a matter of fact, they're the only other group that's getting anything, and they're getting the uh, flex ride system and they've getting an increase on it however for via it's a dramatic loss of uh, of revenue uh, this year out from rtd uh, and as has been the case for many years they are getting about $75 million worth of business in the five-year contract, they will be getting $40 million in the five years. So um, for, for us, it's a dramatic change. For the development of the contract, the whole situation is worth noting because remember I said that a group sued because they had been left out of the contract they've been left out again so um it 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 will be an entertaining spring but quite a problem for those who are um, in the business because as example this one company that's gotten all of the accessor ride is desperately looking for new drivers because they're tripling the amount of service that they will be providing for Accessoride. And companies like Via and others will be under pressure uh, to keep the drivers that they have 
And so there will be an increase in salaries for drivers, which will probably be a second increase for drivers because it is July 1st that the, those contracts that with the unions come up. I thought that might be interesting for the group. Thank you, Tex. Uh, transportation, never a dull moment. Okay. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Okay. Any other county reports? Anything anyone would like to share? No. Our next meeting will be March 24th, and we'll look forward to having Jayla come back and present to us. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending today. It's always nice to see everyone. And my camera's broken. You can't see me, but I can see you. All right. Bye-bye.